I think we're going to get started this evening. Um, we have a few folks that have joined in. That's wonderful. I'm glad to, to see folks have joined in. There's probably going to be a few more coming in. But I just want to say good evening and welcome to our member meeting and speaker series. This is the very first of our 2020-2021 speaker series. I'm Nancy Howell, one of the board members of Western Cuyahoga Audubon. I also pull together our speaker series. And so we try to I have a nice little variety of programs, some scientific, some travelogue, just a lot of, of good stuff. And we'll have some really nice ones coming up this this presentation year. Um, just want to mention that right now we are going to be doing all of our programs virtually online. Um, the, normally when we come, when we uh, get to meet, we are at the Rocky River Nature Center. Uh, at this point they will not be hosting us or any groups they're thinking maybe January 2021, but that's still up in the air. But I have a feeling we're going to continue doing virtual and online programming, mostly because, um, well, we can get a, a nice audience. We can get people from within town, out of town, out of state, even out of the country. So it's, it's just really, really nice to be able to to share our information uh, in so many different ways. So uh, again, thanks for coming this evening. And I cannot believe it is September 1st. Um, I'm excited about September because we have so much going on at Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Um, but we do have some, some uh, of our board members that are available and uh, I would like for them to say hello and uh, just mention some of the things that they are working on. Uh, I think I'm going to begin with uh, Amanda Sobrowski. Amanda. Wait a minute. Oh, there. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm mostly involved with the chimney swifts, and I'm going to talk about that um, more later. But um, I've also written some articles and trying to reach out to other uh, clubs, mostly in relation to chimney swifts. And um, I, I wrote an article about coffee, um, trying to get another club to be involved with uh, using bird-friendly coffee. Um, but that's mostly what I do. Thanks so much, Amanda. We'll, yeah, we will be hearing from Amanda a little bit later on with her Jimmy Swift project. Uh, Michelle Brocious. Michelle, good evening. Hi, everybody. Um, as Nancy said, my name is Michelle. Um, and I am mostly involved with the field trips. I am running a virtual field trip right now uh, since we can't do them in person and then when we start back up with our in-person field trips I will be helping with those as well. And believe it or not virtual field trips are really working. It gives you a whole month of uh, to go and visit places and Michelle's going to chat about that a little bit more about what was done last month and what we're going to be doing this month. Right Michelle? Right. Absolutely. Oh fantastic. Um, Karu, Karu, are you with us this evening? She was earlier. And I don't see Karu. That have I, she may have had to drop away. She has a little baby, Tsukumi, and so I, I'm sure she's really busy with her, her little babies. What a little cutie she is. Um, and I do also want to introduce Betsy O'Hagan who is our webmaster and our social media platform creator, does works wonders. So Betsy, I hope you'll just say a real quick hello as well, too. Hi, everyone. It's nice nice to see you and nice to be here with you this evening. I'm looking forward to learning more and hearing the nice program. Yep. yep. And Betsy's going to be running our slides uh, as we're running through until we get to uh, Ryan's presentation. Uh, but we have lots and lots to talk about, so I'm going to um, 
pass it along to Michelle right now, who is going to chat more about the bird walks, the field trips, and get you all excited about what we've seen and what is happening uh, this month. All right, thank you, Nancy. Uh, Betsy, if you could advance to the slide, please. And that's, that's me, board member and field trip co-coordinator. There you go, thank you. Um, so as Nancy said, I, I'm going to be giving uh, the second Saturday bird walk report, uh, talk a little bit about the virtual field trips, and then review the social distancing birding guidelines. Next slide, please. All right, so um, in-person activities, including our bird walks, continue to be canceled to reduce the spread of COVID-19. However, Bill Dininger and Dave Grosskemper are still going out for the canceled second Saturday bird walks to collect bird survey data for eBird. The August 2nd Saturday on the 8th was a great day of birding. The sun was shining the entire walk and the temperatures reached 81 degrees. In all, 43 species were tallied. Highlights include our local red-tailed hawk, which flew close by perched on a low branch and sat for all of us to get good looks. A barred owl was perched in the pine trees for all to see. A scarlet tanager gave us a great show for several minutes. The tanager had a grub in its beak and was constantly singing. Uh, we suspected the tanager had a juvenile in the area since he kept looking for more food. Uh, we also located an Acadian flycatcher nest. The nest was low and very close to the trail. The parents were actively feeding at least two immature birds, and we saw the adults actually carrying away the fecal sacs away from the nest. So fun times at the, at the Nature Center trails um, in August. All right, next slide, please. All right, so our August virtual field trip. Um, last month, our virtual field trip was at Nimasilla Reservoir at Portage Lakes near Akron to see the purple martins who roost there. Five participants visited Nemesilla either independently with a spouse or as part of a kayaking or canoe club. I am currently compiling the bird list, journaling, and photographs submitted to me into a digital scrapbook. So if you haven't sent me your items, please get those over to me by end of day on Friday. Um, I will then present the scrapbook at our virtual meetup next week on Wednesday, September 9th at 7 p.m. Uh, even if you didn't have a chance to visit Nemesilla last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup uh, in which I will share that scrapbook and we can talk about our experiences at the preserve if anyone um, has anything additional to share. You know what, Michelle also provided that brown booby too. She uh, she made sure. I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Western Cuyahoga, yeah, purple martin, brown boobies. We, you know, we pull out yeah. every, color the, we got every color of the crayon. That was so exciting that, you know, I mean, that, that was a great coincidence. I picked Nemesilla, and then that month we get that record bird come in. Um, so hopefully everyone got a chance to see that. All right, so next slide, please. We'll discuss September's virtual field trip. All right, so um, September's virtual field trip takes place at Lake Isaac. Uh, just wait to see what bird I'll bring in next month, Nancy, or this month. We're in September. Um, you can either sit at the lake or hike the Lake Isaac Trail or even the Lake to Lake Trail. So what, however you want to experience Lake Isaac is fine. This, these field trips are very flexible um, as long as you're in the area and, and birding, we're good. Um, and we will be looking for fall warblers at Lake Isaac. So during your visit, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. You can take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired what, by what you've seen. You can tally identified species, write down your thoughts, create a poem, uh, write down any questions or curiosities about the target species or anything encountered at the location or to do with your experience at visiting um, Lake Isaac. And then send any of these items to me and your contributions will be published in the digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. Now, we will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for the virtual field trip by visiting our website, uh, wcaudubon.org, and clicking the About Virtual Field Trips tile on the home page. And then it's all right there on the screen for you. All right, next slide, please. 
All right, social distancing birding guidelines. So um, as you get out there to bird and enjoy nature during the pandemic, we encourage you to take precautions by limiting your group size to 10 people or less staying six feet apart from others not in your household, traveling separately, uh, wearing a face mask, and washing your hands or using a high alcohol hand sanitizer um, to keep yourself and, and everyone else safe as we get out there and enjoy nature. And uh, that's all I got. Thank you for your attention. Oh, thanks so much, Michelle. That's great. Uh, those meetups after the um, monthly uh, virtual field trips are great. Uh, last month was wonderful. Uh, just a quick note, that big sign that, that says Lake Isaac Waterfowl Sanctuary that was on the previous slide, that sign is no longer there. So, <gasps> yeah, it, well, the woodpeckers got to it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of rotten away, and the woodpeckers kept working away at it. So that sign, I hope people will be able to find it. it it's not that difficult to find. You know, I put it in my, I put the address in my GPS and it took me right there. Yeah, so right. It's, a, it's a little parking area right on the lake. You really can't miss it. Right, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it, again, the, the walk there is, is really easy. Um, you know, everything is pretty level. Uh, if it does rain, the, the trails are a bit on the, the muddy side, so make sure you wear appropriate footwear. Yeah, and I've been out there today already. <laughs> you see what you see. Oh, I can't tell you yet. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, keep your secret. Uh, yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, Gloria Ferris, uh, another one of our board members, um, has is a bit under the weather. She stopped by a little earlier this evening, but uh, just was, was not feeling well. So I'm going to to read her notes um, and Gloria works with a group called the Guardians of Nature, a group of, of again uh, volunteers that um, meet twice a month and they're um, bu busy fundraising, friend raising and working on some programs. So uh, the September meetings are scheduled for the third and fourth Thursday of, of um, the month, so that would be Thursdays 17th of September and the 24th of September. And I believe those meetings are, gosh, the time is not there uh, on, on her notes, but I believe those meetings are at 7. Is I, am I correct, Betsy? Yes, they're on the slide, okay. 7 to 8. All right, I'm reading from her notes, so I'm not on the slide. Um, Gloria also works with the Bird of the Month fundraiser and photo contest, and we're still working out uh, the some of the fundraising, some of the contest rules, um, fine-tuning some things. Uh, last month was was the um, red-winged blackbird as the uh, photo in the contest and Bird of the Month. This month it is the great blue heron. So we would like folks to send in photographs of great blue heron, uh, either in flight or still, you know, sitting still at some point, and that would be awesome. Uh, so we'll have some prizes for that as well. Gloria also works with the book club, and on September 20th, the very first book club meeting will take place, and the author is uh, a local. Her name is Joy Kaiser. And she authored a book called The Other Audubon, uh, a book about um, the nests and eggs of birds that were sketched and painted beautifully. Oh, gosh, this was done in, uh, what, the late 1800s? Um, and, it, oh, just, it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, so we hope that you can join in on September 20th. Uh, for a discussion with Joy and a synopsis of her book, uh, answering questions, that type of thing. And then on September 27th, uh, there's going to be an open discussion of our favorite, or well, your favorite, uh, nature-themed book. So if you have a book that you really, really enjoy and you want to share information about uh, that book, um, please attend the Sunday, September 27th, um, 
book club meeting, and that's just, again, for all of people who want to share something, a book, maybe a passage from the book, a chapter, that type of thing. We'd love to have you available for that. So again, we got so much happening, and it's just so hard to keep track of everything sometimes. So our website is, is wonderful. Uh, it has everything listed, and again, the slides we're sharing with you uh, also uh, have a lot of information where you could sign up and uh, join. All righty. Uh, I'm on next. And I have done a lot of stuff with some challenges and some contests for the fall. Uh, the very, very first, or, well, a couple challenges, as you can see from the slide, we have a dead tree birding challenge. Yep, what birds are sitting in dead trees? We have a fall warbler challenge. That has started already. That started today. And then a fledgling birding challenge. Now, that does not mean we're looking for baby birds in the fall. We're, we're, we call the fledglings the people who are just beginning birding. Or maybe you have young people at home, uh, grandchildren, children, that you might want to go out a little bit and, and do some birding. So uh, let's, let's go to the slide for the dead tree birding challenge. And that is going to take place for four days in September. You can see September 11th through 14th. So that's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And what you do is you select a dead tree. It can't be farther than three miles from where you live. Could be in your neighborhood, a cemetery, a green space, a park, your backyard, your neighbor's yard, whatever. And then you watch that tree and just put a check mark by the, the birds that are sitting in that tree. You don't have to keep tally of the numbers of birds, but oh good, one day there's morning doves, and then you know two hours later there's a, a cardinal, and then oh, a red-bellied woodpecker. So again, it just doesn't matter. We're just my, the goal of this challenge is for all the checklists that will come in, if we can get 50 five zero species in that four days. Do you think we can get 50 species that use dead trees? I think we can. So we'd love you to, to have you sign up. Um, so look at those lovely dead trees in that photo. It's beautiful. Our um, fall warbler challenge is a little bit more challenging. And like I say, that started today, September 1, and it goes all the way through October 31st because this is the time when the warblers are coming through. Um, we just had a little cool front come through a couple days ago, and yes, things started moving. Um, so we would like people to uh, keep track of the warblers that they see. And since it goes two months, uh, you can travel anywhere throughout your county in which you live. So if you're in uh, Lorain County, travel anywhere around Lorain County looking for fall warblers. Um, if you're in Cuyahoga County, anywhere. Um, and we will have a couple of supporting programs to go along with this fall warbler challenge. One is fall warbler identification. That's going to come up in a couple weeks. We're going to do a fall warbler hotspots, where to look for war warblers. We're also going to have some science based on uh, some of the fall warblers as well, too. So, so stay tuned. Again, you can see where the entry tickets are. The WC Audubon uh, website has just oodles of information. So uh, again, well, there will be prizes for this one. Whoever gets the most warblers in that two-month period, second and third prize. So that'll be fun. Our third challenge is the fledgling birding challenge. And like I say, not looking for baby birds, but look for people who are new to birding. People who don't get out maybe very often. People who have kids up there. And look at the date. Friday, November 27th. That's the day after Thanksgiving. And so what we're just going to ask is you go out and we have a list of, of 19 species that you can look for. Very simple, something local right around your neighborhood, maybe a mallard, Canada goose, blue jay, like in the slide. But there's 20 birds we want you to get. 19 of them we have on our list. The 20th is whatever you 
want to add to the list. So maybe while you're out, you don't you have you've seen all the ones on the list, but hey, maybe you happen to run into a red winged blackbird on that day, or a or something else. Toss it on. That'll be a lot of fun. So that's a one day event. Uh, the day after Thanksgiving, you get a chance to maybe walk off that extra turkey sandwich or a piece of pumpkin pie or maybe whet your appetite for another piece of pumpkin pie. Yeah, that sounds more like me. <laughs> so check that one out. Now our fourth thing that's coming up is not a challenge, but it is oh, make a mask, become a bird. Um, yeah, a contest. So since we've got to wear masks anyhow, why not enhance that mask and become a bird? We have two categories for mask making. First of all, you could either choose to make your mask that represents a bird that does exist. In this case, it looks like somebody made a puffin mask, a uh, bald eagle, cardinal, choose whatever you'd like. The second category are fictional birds, fanciful things, maybe something with glitter or pipe cleaners coming out of it, who knows. So a, a little bit of fun with those masks. And again, the mask uh, the, the, that you built this your bird beak on shouldn't be, or should be the mask that you wear, again, simply over your nose to your chin, just like you can see in the photograph. Nothing around the whole face, not like a Halloween mask. Uh, and then we also have several categories for age ranges. Uh, we have youth, we have young adults, we have adults, we have senior citizens. So there's going to be lots of options for prizes. Make the mask starting, you know, or you can begin early, I suppose, October 9th through this, uh, Sunday, October 18th. Take photographs, take video, do TikTok videos of, the, of you know, your family wearing the masks. It's going to be posted on a, a gallery page on our website. And then what's even more fun is that um, members and guests of WCAS will vote on some of the the cool masks that have come in. And then we will announce the winner on Tuesday, October 20th. Winners, I guess I should say, on Tuesday, October 27th. Whew, that's a lot of stuff coming up. But again, it's all fun. Um, you know, why not, why not make it fun since we've got to wear masks and stick around a little bit closer to home. So do some birding nearby. All righty. Amanda, uh, you're up next with some information about the uh, Jimmy Swift Towers. Right. Hi. Uh, first, I need to apologize if I slur. I'm still under the, my mouth is still anesthetized from dental work, so sorry about that. Um, the first uh, tower that I want to talk about is the one in um, Oldfield uh, South Chagrin Reservation for Cleveland Metro Parks. Uh, nobody knows where it came from. I expect it was maybe a Boy Scout project or something, but um, it's in uh, disrepair. So um, I placed the first coat of paint on it, and in October I'll be repainting it and putting a cap and a, and a new bottom on it and um, doing anything else that needs done to repair it. There's another one um, in Cleveland Metro Parks at Strongsville Wildlife Area. Um, I don't know if I got that into Betsy soon enough. It's the one with dark uh, cedar shingles. You may not have it. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, it's in really pretty good shape considering how old it must be because it's got a galvanized drawer in the bottom of it that's completely rusted out. So it must be kind of old, but um, it just needs some uh, siding replaced and uh, a new bottom. Um, but it's, it's uh, in a lot of overgrowth, so it's going to be hard to get a ladder out there. So uh, hopefully I can enlist my husband to do that. Um, for some reason, there's some article that went out and um, a couple of groups in um, uh, Maryland uh, contacted me asking for information about building Chimney Swift Towers. Uh, so I've, uh, I've sent 
one of the group's articles and uh, my plans and um, I, I, Another person, I don't know where she's from, I'm going to have to learn how to pry more, asked for uh, instructions about what to do if a, if a, uh, a big chimney is going to be taken down. And so I gave her, the only, about the only thing I could think of was um, build a tower nearby, as big a tower as you can after the, after the chimney comes down. Um, I've also gotten similar requests on the Facebook page, which is really nice. People asking what to do if babies fall in the chimney and um, what to do if, you know, their chimney swifts are not coming back and things like that. So it's pretty nice. I've been able to um, give people advice about who they can talk to when it's something beyond anything I've read about. Um, I've sent a couple of people to uh, Lake Erie Nature and Science Center for information from Tim Jasinski, who's the all things bird guy. Um, and I've, uh, I, I also want to mention that in October, there's going to be a, um, a, a fundraiser to try and make more money to build uh, Chimney Swift Towers. Unfortunately, right now we're kind of at a standstill, um, mostly because a lot of places have people that are furloughed. So there's, you know, really, it's really slowed down work a lot. But um, we can still fundraise and be ready when everyone else is ready to build towers. I'm also trying to get um, the word out that if any uh, Eagle Scouts need help with building towers that um, I'd be happy to help them with that. So spread the word. That's all I have. Amanda, a question did come in. Um, which of the towers are currently active? Um, it doesn't Where, look like th this brown one is at this point, I don't see any kind of um, nests that were ever built there, but it's quite old, so they could have come down. It, they they don't have the kind of collar on it to keep the rain out, so it could be that they kind of washed away. But uh, the other one has had one nest in it, um, but I don't know if it's it's been used for roosting at all. It's it's hard to tell. There there is um, feces down below it but you never really know for sure what that's from. So starting next year, I'll be uh, paying attention to cleaning them and I'll have a better idea of occupancy. Okay, and then uh, also we're wondering, uh, any places in Northeast Ohio that you know Chimney Swifts are using a, a chimney right now? <laughs> Yeah, my daughter, <laughs> she's got two chimneys in, in, this is in University Heights, and she has chimney swifts in both her chimneys. I'm so jealous. And um, there's a are lot of chimney swifts. I'm sorry? Are they roosting or, or, or is it nesting? Nesting in both okay. chimneys. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm just thinking that, you know, this is the time when they're going to be gathering for roosting and you get those big... Uh -huh world coming in similar to way purple martins do so you're not familiar with yeah. any any um, in the area well parma but it's on the east side at one of the schools i can't remember the name of the school but it's where uh, lake erie nature and science center uh, releases all their chimney swifts so they can learn how to be swifts <laughs> from the from oh, the adults they, they, okay. they have a big population there okay you but don't know not the on this side school? I'm sorry? Well, Par Parma's, Parma's west side. Oh, oh, I always considered it kind of east, southeast, or anyway, yeah, Parma's Parma, yeah, yeah, it, I'm has, not, uh, it has a big population. Okay, but you don't know the name of the school? No, but I can get it and we could post it. Okay, yeah, I think maybe that's what we'll do, so maybe, um, uh, I know I live near Berea, and Berea sometimes gets uh, some roosting sites. Um, oh, the browns, really? The brown, yeah, the browns from Akron are wondering. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the Akron area, so yeah. uh, maybe I can ask around some of my friends from the Akron area, and we can post it on your on your site. How about that? Right, that would be great. 
Okay. I'll post yep. the, um, I'll try and find it before the end of our meeting and let everyone know where the school. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a, a great update. Uh, and it's so nice to hear that people are reaching out to you, um, the expert, right? Yeah. Well, well I'm no ex expert, but I'll, I'll <laughs> find an expert if I don't know the answer from reading. But uh, yeah, I was pretty excited how many people have uh, gotten a hold of me. Fantastic. I hope your mouth feels better, too. <laughs> yeah, well, the anesthesia wearing off, so. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Thanks so much, Amanda. All right. Well, I also want to do a quick mention that it is membership renewal time for Western Cuyahoga Audubon. Um, our our uh, membership runs from August 1st through the end of um, I'm sorry, September 1st through the end of August, uh, August, so that's our membership year. And membership renewal takes place, again, begin, it began August 1st through the end of October, but th that doesn't mean you can't renew or get a membership afterwards. So we will accept memberships at any time. Um, there's a, a family, there's individual, there's a, a lot of different categories. So very affordable and uh, again very worth it because we have so much going on and thank you for that all right um, now next month's speaker um, is a real treat and I hope a, a lot of folks will be able to join us uh, in October Roseberry Mosco um, she does the comics called bird and moon and if the book looks familiar and the drawings look familiar, maybe you've seen some of her work. But she is fabulous. Uh, she's not a local artist and naturalist, um, but we, I, I contacted her and she is just so excited about work talking with us. But she is a, a naturalist, um, but she twists it a little bit differently and does it does you know, the, the, the comic book style. Uh, but they're very, very accurate, and I think you're going to have a great time. So Tuesday, October 6th, uh, at 7.30, right here on this same station, please join us for, for uh, Rosemary Moscow, Bird and Moon, Comics with a Naturalist Knowledge. We, I can't wait for that. And then, of course, this evening, we are going to enjoy... Uh, Ryan Trimbat, the ecologist with the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And um, I know he spoke of maybe to some other groups, but he's going to speak with us about the hybridization of cerulean and perula warblers. And I can't wait to hear, because I did not hear the original uh, uh, program with another group. So I am really excited about this evening. And he's going to update us, you know, what happened this year. So Ryan, we're so happy to have you here this evening. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here. I'm going to present this talk. Um, as you can see by the title page, that was one thing I didn't edit from July, uh, June 25th, 2019. Um, I gave this presentation to the Greater Akron Audubon Society. Clearly, so I did. I did, you know, update it and put some edits in. I thought I changed that, but I obviously didn't. Say that. So I'm going to present to you some work that uh, I I did. I was lucky to find this warbler. So this this is you know the punchline is right in front. Like there's going to be no surprises. Evidence of hybridization between uh, cerulean warbler and northern perula. Boom. Um, we could we could end the talk here, but I don't want to end it. I'd like to uh, spend some time uh, talking about birds. So I'm going to hope hope we make this interesting and tell you the story about what we. What, I just, what we worked on here. So the basic outline, I'm going to give you some background on hybridization. Um, is everyone hearing me okay? Is it coming in clearly? Yes. Great. Okay, so background on hybridization. A um, uh, little bit about my obsession with cerulean warblers and the story of discovery. I think this is just kind of something that's fun that I like to talk about. Uh, because the the series of events that led to finding this this hybrid warbler and being in the position to um, gather this evidence was just it's miraculous in some ways in my opinion. Um, and I'll give you the evidence that we used for you know confirming this hybridization and we'll move on to a discussion. 
So to start off, I think you know Nancy was just asking what is a hybrid, but uh, I think I think it's important for us to sometimes step back even further and ask ourselves and ask, you know, science, what is a species? When I call something a species, you know, what am I saying? And how did we come to that determination that something is a species? So there's all sorts of different, like, species concepts. Uh, and we've gone, used various tools to get to a point where we're saying, okay, this species is different from, from, from that. Or this, this thing is a different species from this thing over here. And a lot of times, you know, historically, Darwin and other, you know, early naturalists, they were using morphological data. They would measure different, you know, um, <clears throat> bones in the, in the head or length of feathers and all sorts of morphological characteristics to try to find differences between, you know, a bird that you collected in New Hampshire versus a bird you collect in, let's say, Florida. You know, they might look very similar, but they might have slight morphological differences um, that you can see uh, by, you know, intensive study of, of the bones or something physical that you can collect. Um, there's the biological species concept, which really focuses on, uh, um, you know, can these things breed? So here's a picture of an uh, eastern meadowlark on top and a western meadowlark on the bottom. And so those species that are two different, we call them two different species. They don't overlap in their ranges, so there's no breeding. So there you go, you have a new species. Um, genetic tools have given us, you know, a lot of insight into species. Uh, you know, we can now can do, use genetics to um, look at how long ago within a phylogeny uh, or a family tree um, two groups have split. And that can be anywhere from a population level, so you can look at birds in southern Ohio to birds in northeast Ohio. How genetically different are they? And, you know, what is the type of gene flow? How often do they, do they mix? Or you can look at that, you know, at a broader evolutionary context to, to really start to get an understanding of, of um, the uh, structure of a family tree or, or species and when different species within a group like Perulidae, like the warblers, might have split off. And then you see these people talk about like species like Triceratops, and that's always like really, really crazy to me. So there's the term like chrono species. So you go through, you're looking back through you know, geological time, millions of years, you find like this bone of a of a of a skull, and you all of a sudden can determine that this thing is a different species or like uh, a, a, you know a female of a new species or something. And so that application of the term species to things like fossil dinosaurs or fossil, you know, anything really just kind of blows my mind because without um, understanding the ecology, biology, and, you know, just going off of really small pieces to, to, to reconstruct, you know, what this, this organism looked like and come to the conclusion that it's a new species just really is crazy to me. Um, but, but they are perspectives and it's still talking about a species, and so as I start this conversation, I think it's always important for people to think about what is a species, and why are we calling them a species, and, and, and get into the philosophical side of it. Um, but we won't go too much further into that. We'll go straight to Nancy's question. I have the same one. You know, what is a hybrid? So a hybrid is when two different species are, uh, are intermingling and uh, creating offspring, right? So one of the most common hybrid um, examples in the warbler world is, and maybe even in the bird world, is the uh, golden wing warbler and the blue wing warbler hybridization. So blue wing warblers are very common here in Ohio. You probably see them through the breeding season, um, buzzing in shrubs all over the place. Uh, and the golden wing warbler is the closely closely related species that has a more northern breeding range. And where those two populations, those two species uh, ranges overlap, we see that they are actually hybridized. And this is causing some issues for the golden wing warbler, and it's actually declining because of this hybridization. But we won't go too far into that right now. But uh, when the golden wing warbler and the blue wing warbler cross, we, we created these hybrids that we we actually have names for because originally we thought they were different species. Um, and so it's a, it's a really unique and common thing. It's a common thing in this um, com species complex or uh, within this, this overlap range, but um, a good example of what you know, hybridization is. And, we, and when two species that are different hybridize, you get a, a, a bird or, a, or an animal that has 
you know, shares characteristics from each species. And you kind of, you know it when you look at it, you're like, that's not a golden wing warbler, and you can see the different characteristics of each. So, um, within the family Perulidae, so that's the, the, the new world warblers, that's all, all of our wood warblers that we, we look to see during migration and the breeding season. Um, there's about um, 110, over 110 species. Um, based on a genetic species concept. Uh, and hybridization is pretty heavily studied. As I mentioned, the blue-winged, the golden-winged warbler complex, um, as well as the Townsend's and Hermit warblers uh, hybridization, which happens out west. Um, I can't see the chat, but um, it'd be cool if you guys have seen any hybrids. Uh, throw that in the chat. Let us know if warblers or any other species uh, pairings that you, you've seen. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if uh, you have any unique observations. So it's pretty, pretty heavily studied in, in those areas, but um, in, you know, other combinations might seem to be, are, are definitely rare, but we do see you know, almost half of all Perulid species have some sort of hybrid uh, event documented. So hybridization, of, it might be one, one individual specimen that we have in a museum somewhere or pictures of it, but we have like a lot of evidence where um, uh, warblers specifically have hybridized. And you probably have heard of like uh, the, the hybridization between mallards and black ducks and waterfowl actually do a lot of hybridization. So throughout the bird world, we see a lot of uh, uh, hybridization um, and it always uh, turns into a unique and cool observation that kind of throws the, throws the birder off and um, gets them a little excited. Um, and we get more and more hybrid hybrids documented every year. So this is the, the most recent one I'm aware of. Uh, Andy Jones at the Clean Museum of Natural History has become one of the, the experts in hybrids around here. I, I feel like every time I talk to him, he's telling me, somebody found this bird and they sent me a feather. We think it's a hybrid and does the genetic analysis. But this one was uh, discovered by Gunnar Kramer. Uh, I think he's a grad, was a grad student at the University of Toledo and um, caught this bird and thought it was a hybrid between a cerulean and a blue-winged warbler. And in fact, uh, when they did the analysis, genetic analysis, it, it, helped, it supported that hypothesis. And uh, they recently published it. So we're learning more and more about hybridization um, all the time. So our two species we're going to talk about today, the cerulean warbler on the left and the northern perula on the right, are very closely related. Um, in fact, you know, the perula its its closest relative in the in its uh, phylogeny would be the tropical perula, uh, which uh, doesn't breed in North America. That's a you know, tropical species. Um, but the next closest relative is the cerulean warbler. So when you have species that are closely related, um, what we generally see is that those individuals are more likely to to hybridize. But we in the warbler family, you know, we do see what we could call distant relatives hybridizing. Um, but this is an example of where we have two really closely related species where you would you would suspect that there could be the potential for hybridization. And if uh, any of you study the habitat characteristics or the song of the cerulean and the perula, you know that there's a lot of similarities there as well. Um, and they can actually sing each other's songs at times and, and can be quite confusing. So that's a little background on um, hybridization within, in general and within the warbler world. Um, but to, to help you understand how we got to this point where you know we, we found a, um, a hybrid, two hybrids actually. Uh, I'm not an expert in hybrids. I really like birds. I became really interested in cerulean warblers when I worked down in Southern, well, went to school in Southern Ohio at Ohio University. Um, the species is just, it's, it's, you know, a symbol of mature forests in my mind. Like when I, when I find a cerulean warbler, when I'm with a cerulean warbler in the woods, I feel like I'm in the place that I want to be. Like they're just, this, they represent so much ecologically. Uh, kind of like an umbrella species, you might say, where when I'm when you're around it, you're probably in some really nice woods. And I like nice woods. Um, and the female is just soup. It's beautiful. Here's a picture of a female in the middle there. Um, they vary in color from like a green to a, a seafoam green to blue. Um, and just you know, every time you you see one or catch one, 
are, are lucky to, um, you see that that uh, you, you're just kind of like, oh wow, what color is it? So they all they all seem unique. Um, males are really cool. Uh, I always post pictures on Facebook when I have when I catch uh, ceruleans. This one was from 2013. I haven't caught very many since then, so I feel kind of like I need to need to uh, do that again. But life has gotten in the way, right? Um, and the other thing with ceruleans is like they are one of the fastest declining land birds in North America. They're rapidly declining. Uh, it's been, you know, some say they were the most common land bird at one time, or songbird, land songbird, um, and their populations have just declined tr uh, tremendously and are, are globally imperiled at this point. So I became really obsessed with them. Um, I actually was lucky enough to follow them around and Southern Ohio, uh, working like in Zaleski's and Tar uh, Zaleski's and uh, Reckon Creek Ecological Management Area is a really cool spot to, to study their dem demography. So um, when I I started uh, grad school at University of Akron in like 2012, and I was working for some Metro Parks. They were supporting me, and uh, they were really interested in cerulean warblers locally, uh, largely because we've seen this local, really a tremendous local local decline as well as the global decline. Here's some records from uh, Dwight and Ann Chaucer at Brexville Reservation. They um, continue the census that Harold Whalen started back in, or you know, worked on back in the 1940s, um, and you see cerulean warblers at Brexville Reservation went from, uh, you know, the, in the 1940s there was 10 birds there, 46, it was like 17 birds, so we had like an increase over time. Um, and we get to 2002, and there's like two birds there, two two males, two uh, breeding pairs there, um, and uh, it's probably stayed about there now, depending upon year-to-year -year variation. Uh, so we got generally interested in Summit County while well, I was working for Summit Metro Parks, where cerulean warblers were, and they were at Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Um, so within the national park, I became really focused and interested in knowing. You know where they're breeding in in the, within the park. You know what they're doing, uh, what habitats they're in, and you know are they you know successfully breeding at this site? You know how many are there? Because you can find you can go to eBird and you can find a ton of observations, um, especially at places like uh, like um, Station Road. And the thing is about, about eBird observations is a lot of those are just, you know, an observation of a singing male. And what we've learned through studies of, of songbirds is that that can be uh, a bit misleading, especially in areas with, like, fragmented forests and edge effects and cowbirds and raccoons and all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of times you'll hear males singing all summer, and they never find a mate. So we wanted to know a little bit more about what was going on there. Um, what's interesting about cerulean warblers is that if you go to birds in North America, I love this description, uh, distribution is bimodal. So the species is found in riparian bottomlands or on upper mesic slopes, that's like dry slopes, and dry mountain ridges of elevations greater than uh, 500 meters of uh, elevation. So, but, but not, but often not in between. So you think about a place like the Cuyahoga Valley, um, I hope many of you have been there, I'm assuming. Um, we have these bottomland forests so along the river in the riparian corridor, so we have that type of habitat, you know, mixed sycamore, buckeye, cottonwood, those really nice riparian forests. And, and not far up the hill, you see, you get into these dry music, you know, white oak um, upland forests. Uh, so the bimodal distribution, you know, we have all that kind of within a stone's throw of each other. So it creates a really interesting ecological situation. So I was wanting to know, you know, are they in the bottomlands more than the uplands? Is there a difference in success uh, in the bottomlands versus the uplands? Um, so these are the types of questions I was trying to, to answer. Um, and, and what we found is that, yeah, that, those type of habitats, again, if you go, you know, name drop some sites, if you go want to, Get into some riparian forests. You can go to Deep Lock Quarry or Station Road. Pretty much anywhere along the towpath where you get into forested habitat. Um, then we have a lot of really good upland sites like the Wetmore Trailhead area and Oak Hill, where you have uh, again these dry ridges with a lot of oak. And and that is pretty much where you'll find ceruleans in our in Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Um, 
over the three years, you know, there's not a ton of them. Um, I tried to cover as much ground as I could. Um, so over three years, I only was able to monitor 26 males. So that was I found them singing and I um, uh, you know, followed them throughout the year. Um, and through this process, I seldom found females. So just uh, when anytime you're doing a demographic study, the, the uh, trying to find bird nests and understand what they're doing, the kind of the process that you use is you go find the males. And then the males will always lead you to their females. And if you can be, you know, skilled enough and patient enough to follow a female around, she'll eventually show you where she's built in her nest um, or where she has built her nest or feeding her young. Um, so I used these skills that I, that I learned down in southern Ohio um, I, and became very familiar with cerulean um, behavior and was able to apply, apply that here in Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So seldom seeing females. Um, it's partially the difficulty in finding the females, but also um, I'm not sure if they were there. So we'll, we'll talk about that more. Um, I found three nests um, and confirmed fledging on four territories. So that, that, that meant um, one of the nests that I found fledged, and I found adults feeding young at, at us. Uh, a few other places. Here's the best picture I got a volunteer to take, Jerry Cannon. If any of you know him, he's a great, awesome volunteer. Looks a lot with Summit Metro Parks. Um, you can see the cerulean warbler female there, and her nest is kind of to the left there. This is in an elm tree um, at uh, Deep Block Quarry. You can see these little like white, um, white splotches there. That's actually she's about to fledge her young, and they're pooping off the side of the nest there, but. Otherwise, it's a very well camouflaged nest, about 30 feet off the ground, hanging over the canal. Um, so, from the time that I, you know, you know, had uh, chasing these birds around, I still, you know, question, you know, where are the females? Like, why am I not seeing females? What's going on with this population? Um, and and you know, are these males actually attracting females? Because you'll see these observations on eBird. You have, uh, you know. A bird singing, a male singing, you know, well into into June, uh, late, well into July, um, and we hear them. And a lot of times, again, that's a sign that a male just hasn't found a female and he's just singing all summer. So some evidence to suggest, you know, we are getting, we are attracting cerulean warbler males, but they might not actually be, you know, attracting the females as well and, and have a, a robust breeding population. But um, in this effort, you know, we spent, I spent a lot of time walking around places like Deep Lock Quarry, and um, the one morning when I went out there, you know, I, I've been to this place by June 26, 2014. I had probably been there once a week since May, so like eight or ten times, and the one morning I just got there and, and I heard a, a weird sound in the trees. I'm going to try to play this sound for you. Let's see, actually. Um, Try to turn the volume up on it. So we're gonna play it and see if it works. There's a lot of background noise. Uh, you might not hear it very well, but let's uh, let's see. There you can hear the thing there. There you go again. Yeah. There's a bike going by. Why did you set that other person? Yellow warbler. So it's now it's starting to sing a little louder. If you're familiar with the cerulean or the perula, um, and you know their songs, you might be hearing this bird singing, and you might, what I noticed, you might notice what I noticed, which was a song that the cadence sounds like a cerulean warbler, but the tone uh, has characteristics of a of a perula. And so um, there it is again. I hope, I'm hoping you guys can hear this. I'll let it play for another moment. And um, all the recordings I had came from my iPhone, so they're really low quality. Um, they are available on Xeno. Sorry, go ahead. I think you have to change the settings on your on your computer in order. None of us are hearing the sound. 
Okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah, uh, Betsy and I had those issues with it uh, when, we, when we tried to see if it would work. Um, uh, we'll share those. Uh, they're on Xenocanto. You can go listen to them. There's like five recordings under my name. Um, I think Betsy said we can put it in the chat for you to check out. Uh, they're longer recordings. You can just you know, listen to them if you'd like. Uh, I realize that they're still um, categorized as unidentified because they wouldn't let me put it in as a hybrid, so I have to go back and, and update that. But um, again, so I heard this weird song in the trees, and I started looking through, looking at this bird through my binoculars, and I'm like wiping, you know, fog condensation off of my, off of my, uh, you know, binocular lenses, and I'm trying to see what this thing is, and I'm like, that doesn't look like a cerulean. I don't know what, I don't know what this thing is. Um, it looks kind of like a perula, and I was like trying to take a picture of it through my binoculars with my phone. And I'm just like, you know, what are you doing? Like, go get your net. I have a, I have a net in my car, a this net for catching these birds. Um, and I, I just needed to go get it and catch this thing. This was like an awesome opportunity to try and figure out what this was, and I was you know, in the right place and had the right tools. So I went back to my car and I called my master bander, Kelly Williams. If any of you know her, she's a professor down at uh, Ohio University, an old friend of mine. But um, she was like, go catch the bird, Ryan. So I went out and I set up my mismet and um, used playback to get, I uh, used the Perula song, pretty aggressive Perula song, and actually got the bird to jump into my net, which was really exciting. Um, so when we got it, I can confirm that there was something, you know, different about this bird. So you'll see Six pictures He's not here. Caravan, he just two on the right, and then you have the two on the top, and the pru on the bottom there. What's that? And uh, the characteristics no, I know. of these hybrids, you know. these hybrids are in case you see they generally another. look like ceruleans, in oh, my opinion. Um, on that top left picture, the beak looks huge. I think that's just the camera angle. But um, what we did see was the sweet supercilium with the, um, the the typical necklace of a ceruleum warbler. And some yellow wash on the breast that you typically see on a perula, obviously not as extensive. Um, and uh, some green wash on the back. This bird, if you look up close on that back picture, you can see the feather quality is actually pretty poor, uh, relatively abraded, and it's the term we use for that. Um, so it's kind of curious as to why it's feathered that way. But um, sometimes you see that in juvenile birds, but this is definitely not a juvenile um, bird. So we caught it and characterized it, and measured it, took pictures, and took some blood and feather samples. Um, I then that sent that. Uh, sorry, it's dancing or not. I sent that uh, tissue sample off to Andy Jones and Courtney Brennan at the National History Museum, and uh, they were working on doing the genetic analysis. And apparently, it's not so easy to replicate uh, DNA or to get DNA to be. Um, Amplified, excuse me, through PCR, and they were having some issues, and they were trying very hard. But uh, a year went by, and um, I was still looking for these birds. I was very curious about them, and so the next year I was hiking around at uh, Oak Hill Trailhead, and I had another similar experience um, where I had a, heard a weird, weird song in the trees, and once I got my binoculars on, I could see some some strange characteristics. Uh, and, and again, the, the song it just didn't sound right. So I caught it again. This time I had my uh, friend, co-worker Dan Toth out there with me. Um, and he helped me set up the net because this bird did not want to get caught. But uh, we went out a couple days and ended up being able to catch him. Um, and showed some very similar That's characteristics. Really you know, the white supercilium, well. yellow wash on the breast, uh, with the, the, the typical the necklace of the uh, cerulean warbler. So you can see the white on the tail, uh, retrices, outer trail, tail retrices, that was unique too. Um, and not as much green wash, but a little bit of green wash on the back. Uh, if you look at the spread wing photograph, another cool thing that you can do is age these birds based on their molting. And if you're familiar with that, you look at the uh, difference in the color between the, the uh, primary and secondary coverts. Um, and I, I wish I had a, like a laser pointer I could point at it, but if you look on the wing photo, um, the primary coverts oh, yeah, are the, like right you can see the, the white feathers there, the primary coverts are uh, 
uh, the furthest ones to the right there, and you can see they're kind of a dullish, dullish gray, brown, and then the ones to the left are, are stark black. And when you see a characteristic like that, you know it's it's a second year bird. So the bird was born the previous year, and it's its first year breeding. Um, so this bird caught in 2015 was aged as a second year bird, and the bird from the previous year was also aged as a second year bird. So the idea of it them both having come from the same nest or the same having the same parents, it, well, having the same parents I guess is a potential, but they definitely didn't come from the same nest because they were born in different years. So this was really exciting, and again, I banded the first one, so we knew this was a, a unique individual. Um, what was even more unique about this observation is that after a few times going back and, and checking it out, what I realized is that that male had a female cerulean warbler tending a nest within his territory. So if you look in the center of the picture there, I'm gonna, this slide zooms in, it's really grainy, but you can just see um, uh, the female cerulean, I hope you can see that, uh, feeding a what looks like a warbler. I'm assuming it's a warbler <laughs> um, nestling in the nest. Uh, this is a really weird place, if you can tell um, from the previous picture, this picture. Uh, it looks like a living tree, but it's actually a dead ash tree, and the vegetation that you're seeing is poison ivy. So it's a, this was in a very um, not characteristic habitat for ceruleans uh, or perulas, really. Um, so I was really surprised, one, to find that bird, the male there, and then two, that he actually found a female and, and was apparently raising young. But um, one thing to know about songbirds, specifically warblers, is that even within your, your nest, so you have your um, social mate, so you've attracted this female into your territory, and now you want to raise young with that, with that individual. What we see is there's a really high rate of what we call extra pair paternity where the male is actually, the, the nest within the male's territory, the eggs are, are often fertilized, like sometimes 30, sometimes 50, 75% of the eggs within your nest are sired by a male from somewhere else. Maybe your neighbor, maybe the guy that's two doors down or from a whole other neighborhood, um, but a lot of times they're actually siring someone else, or they, there's actually um, raising someone else's young. Uh, so I can't confirm, you know, that this was his, the hybrid's um, offspring, but that would be pretty, pretty interesting and pretty monumental to say that the hybrid was capable of siring and crossing back with the cerulean. So I don't know what the outcome was there. Um, so after catching these birds, again, the same thing. We put, put it all together. We wanted to report this. Um, we put together a plumage description of the birds that we saw. Again, to summarize that, I have this figure from our manuscript. You know, they both had the white supercilium, uh, or white eyering, sorry, with the blue necklace, some yellow wash on the chest, a little bit of green on the back, and the white on the outer tail retrices, which again points to some sort of mixture of, of the, the two species. Um, we characterized the song, so Courtney Brennan actually did this work as the figure from our manuscript, and I'm not going to try to play these sounds because that, that hasn't worked so far. Um, but if you look at the, the Cerulean Warbler sonogram for their, their typical song uh, is, is box A, and then the Perula is box B, and then the hybrid, um, the box C is. You can see some of the, the, the characteristics Again, I'm really bad at explaining these sonogram things. This was Court, Courtney's um, uh, specialty there. Uh, what we see when we look at the sonograms and listen to their songs is, yeah, we have something that is a blend between hybridization between the two. Um, and of course, we went to the literature to you know see if who else has actually seen this pair. Has anybody seen a hybrid between a, a northern perula and a cerulean warbler? And uh, probably the most Famous one, the, the, the early, one of the earliest observations that got the most attention was um, uh, Rick Nershall up near Toledo, who found what he suspected to be a northern Perulian and cerulean warbler hybrid based on the song and the plumage that he saw. Uh, this bird actually came back a couple of years, and they got to study it pretty well. But again, no, 
genetic material, just suggesting based on behavior and um, a bird that looks fairly similar to the one that we caught, but you don't see the, the necklace there. There was actually quite a few observations. Uh, so this is another one from um, uh, Dutchess County, New York, 2004. Some people observed a very similar observation, what they assumed to be a hybrid. Um, and when, when we went through the literature, we found uh, actually um, seven of them, and seven published records. And uh, there's some on and some new ones on eBird now currently. But uh, seven published records that had a description or a picture that we could. Uh, use that information to compare to ours. So this is just a table. It probably looks really confusing. Across the top, you have the species. So the the, the species descriptions of cerulean and no, northern Peru and cerulean warbler. Those are your first columns. And then our our hybrids H1 and H2 we call them. And then the apparent hybrids are those ones we found in the literature. Um, some interesting observations from from. Uh, from this, you know, our, our weight, the weight of these birds were eight and a half and nine grams, um, which falls kind of in the middle of these two. Uh, the wing cord was actually short, so 58 and 59 millimeters, which falls into the range of a parula. Um, and then if you look across the characteristics like the facial markings, you know, the white eye arcs, uh, most of them had it. Uh, the one bird in, in Pennsylvania, it was not recorded and we didn't have a picture. Um, but again, the, the, the white eye arcs are something we see in perulas and not in ceruleans. So that's interesting that most of them showed that perula characteristic. Um, uh, best, uh, breast band, throat color, you know, all, you can look at all these. There's abbreviation. So WT means white. So if you look at throat color, right, um, they were all white in the hybrids. That's what WT stands for. Um, the back color was either not recorded or, or variable. Some breast color, some of it had the faint yellow like we observed, while others were just um, um, white. So even within these putative hybrids, you know, we did see a lot of variation uh, in those characteristics. Um, what I found to be really interesting is when I went and actually mapped the distribution of these birds, um, where they were. So the the um, gray on the map here is the breeding range of the northern perula. Um, and the, uh, the letters, so you have symbols, stars, were birds that were observed during what we're calling breeding season, breeding observations. There was a, a bird that stuck around into the breeding period, whereas the, the, the circles, the black circles, are observations that seem to be in passing, so they might, were likely hybrids or stopovers um, that didn't remain in there through the breeding season. But they all kind of line up along this latitudinal line where you have, uh, if you can see it well, so this Perula breeding range, they have kind of a disjunct, a little bit of a disjunct population where you have the southern sec section, and then it's kind of a gap in the in the Great Lakes region, and then you have a, a northern breeding breeding range. And uh, the cerulean, the, 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 the uh, diagonal lines there, they're kind of spread out a little bit more sporadically. But they, these all these observations come along a similar latitudinal line that kind of lines up with the northern end of the of the Perula, um, the northern end of the the southern Perula um, <laughs> breeding range. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a weird pattern. Just something I can point out and not not explain totally at this point. Um, so at this point, you know, we've been you know waiting for our molecular evidence to come through, and we finally got our molecular evidence, and it kind of it, it helped confirm our assumptions. So we use nuclear DNA. Uh, these are two gene sequences, the Musk gene and the myoglobin gene. If you look at these tables, table two and table three. You can see, you know, A, T, C, G, those are your uh, amino acids. And um, you can compare, you know, what's typically found in a cerulean to what's typically found in a perula. And if you have a mixture of both, um, then you have evidence to support that you have a hybrid there. So that's what both of these are suggesting. And then what's really cool is um, molecular DNA, uh, sorry, mitochondrial DNA um, can tell you about 
the paternity and, and maternity. So if you remember back to early days in biology, um, you inherit your mitochondrial DNA from your mother. You do not get any mitochondrial DNA from your father. Um, that is um, uh, just a process because uh, the, the sperm does not deliver its mitochondrial DNA into the egg. All of the mitochondria replicate themselves within the egg and utilize 100% of the, well, I don't know if it's 100%, that's, there's some debate there, uh, the mitochondrial DNA from the mother to, to reproduce mitochondria. So you can extract mitochondrial DNA and compare those uh, sequences to both species, and if it matches one or the other, then you know who the mother was. And so with that mitochondrial DNA, uh, using this MD2 gene, we found that both hybrids were identical to cerulean warbler sequences um, and differed largely from the, the northern Perula. And so what that, that supports between the measurements and um, descriptions of song and molecular data, we, we suggest that a, we have a, both birds had a female cerulean warbler as a mother and a northern Perula male as the father. So uh, very exciting uh, to, to be able to even know that part of it, the, the, you know, who the mom and the dad was. Um, and you start to think about like, you know, why, why in general, like why did this happen and why do birds hybridize? Um, probably the most common known example of a hybrid that people like learn in, in, in elementary school is the mule, right? So you have a horse, you have a donkey, and um, you want to share some of the characteristics of the two. You know, horses have these luscious manes, and they're they're very pretty. Um, and I don't know why the mule has been something that people prefer for for various things. Like you know, you hear the term pack mule. I think they have the weight carrying ability and and so, and um, uh, various characteristics that make them useful for carrying carrying weight. Um, historically, but the thing with the mule is it cannot breed. So hybridizing between these a horse and a donkey creates a sterile offspring. And a lot of times in hybridization, that is the case. Uh, you have sterile offspring, so it's basically an evolutionary um, dead end. So hybridization is discouraged in, in many ways. But hybridization might not, you know, be something that is negative. Uh, it's not it's not always the case that you create sterile offspring and understanding the importance of hybrid speciation or hybridization in in the process of speciation and to getting getting us to the point where we're at today where we see the diversity that we have um, is a very interesting topic so uh, if you think about um, something like a finch, Galapagos finch, or, or uh, you know, that show these distinct characteristics where you might have a small beak and a big beak, and, and they're 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 both good at certain things, and that's suited for a certain environment, like a specific island. But maybe you these two species then you know uh, colonize a new island, and the food source changes, and it's in fact that if you mix these two birds to create a more generalist um, uh, beak morphology that might actually be more successful than either of the parental um, morphologies. So there is some evidence to show that this hybrid speciation uh, as a process for for adaptation and creating the you know the, the, the diversity that uh, a population needs to to thrive in an environment is actually a real thing and might have some some. Uh, broad implications. And again, I'm not at all an expert on this. I, I just like to think about this, like why would this happen? Um, why, why would a bird do this? Um, and the other thing I turn to is like thinking about bird life history. And I, and I you know, like to think about evolutionary theory, but I also uh, like to think about like individuals and their decisions. And so a lot of you probably are familiar with a, a map on the left here, like the the distribution of the of black pole warbler. Like you see a blue blob, this is where they're at in the winter time, and then that blue blob moves and they become this orange blob um, and during the breeding season. And sometime in between, if you go to the yellow place, you know you might find the bird. Um, but you know that 
blobs don't migrate, right? The individuals do, and we're learning more and more and more about individuals and what they do. This is some more. Uh, this is a a graphic explaining the uh, fall migration of um, black pole warblers using geolocators. We see, you know, these individuals are moving from their breeding grounds, stopping over. Um, uh, on the Atlantic coast and doing this, you know, single flight back to their to their um, uh, wintering grounds. But you know, those aren't blobs moving again. These are individuals that are, you know, showing these patterns that we see. And so I really like to think about, okay, what was that individual doing? Why did it stop there? Why did it stay there for as long as it did? Why did it choose that male? You know, and. Uh, when we think about those individuals, we can also pull in other concepts of understanding of the life history of these birds um, and think about how reproduction actually happens. So this is a, I guess this is a talk about the birds and the bees. Surprisingly, there was like I googled um, warblers copulating and this is the best thing I could find was a hand-drawn image. So if you have any pictures of warblers <laughs> Copulating. I'd love to uh, update my presentation with them, but um, you know, everybody knows we talked about for, sperm fertilizes the egg, but think about when does that happen? So in these warbler species, um, the egg is fertilized the day before it's laid. So when they're laying a clutch, so say they're going to lay four eggs, the female is going to lay one egg every day for four days. And that egg that they're laying is going to have been fertilized the day before. So what we see is this mate guarding, so where the male is like following the female around uh, the day before she lays the egg and other males are coming over and he's fighting with those males. And sometimes those other males get an opportunity to uh, actually mate with them. And sometimes those females actually uh, make the choice to go run off their territory and, and mate with other males. And again, this is why we see uh, such high rates of extra pair paternity. So um, I think that, you know, I don't have any conclusions related to that, but um, there was like a decision that was made by these birds. So these birds, this, fem this female cerulean warbler and this male northern perula, found themselves in a situation where it just like everything lined up for them and they decided they were going to uh, to reproduce and trying to understand like why why an individual would make that decision. Why would that female be like, I don't need a civilian male and as my previous study showed or suggested is that there's plenty of male cerulean warblers out there. They just can't get a female into their territory to reproduce with. So why did this one choose something else? And um, one, one hypothesis, I guess you can you can call it, uh, uh, is related to looking at so cerulean warbler populations are plummeting; they're declining rapidly. Um, while well, northern perulas are actually doing fairly well for for various reasons, but um, their populations are expanding, especially in Ohio. So if you're a female and you're you're looking for a mate, you know, is a successful individual of a different species maybe worth giving a try uh, when, when the males of your species are, are, are not capable of uh, are showing, you know, this, this rapid decline. So Andy Jones always, um, he said this to me a, a couple times when I've brought that up to him, he's, he's used the phrase, any port in a storm. So when, when uh, things are tough, you know, you're going to, you can turn to whoever's closest or whatever uh, seems to be there to, to comfort you. And uh, this picture, I just Googled any port in a storm and this came up and I don't really know why this picture exists, or what they're trying to say uh, with it. But um, that, those are words from, from my uh, a mentor of mine, Andy Jones. And thinking about, you know, is this, are they doing this because they're, uh, populations are declining. Are they trying to find a way out of this just, you know, rapid decline? Um, who knows? So I'm hoping that with this work that we've done, we'll actually uh, continue to, to get more observations. Uh, it's well documented. Hopefully we'll get more observations of these hybrids, uh, learn more about them, and really get a sense for, you know, how widespread that um, uh, hybridization actually is. Uh, so with that, um, those are my, you know, 
attempt at making conclusions and, and making this uh, more interesting. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I thank you know Salt Metro Parks, Colorado Valley National Park, and Cleveland uh, Museum of Natural History who you know supported this project. Dan Toth provided the actual photographs of the hybrids. He was there with me when I caught the birds. Um, Kelly Williams, my master bander, all bird lovers, and uh, the people of Summit County, especially for supporting their parks, which um, allowed me to do that study, that uh, discover those hybrids. So with that, I will um, give some time for questions, or if we're out of time, uh, whatever. Uh, so if you have questions you want to send to me, my email is there, Ryan Trimbath, or TrimbathRJ at gmail.com. Um, our manuscript was published, and if you're interested in that, you can email me, and I can send it to you. And again, uh, the the, um, the auditory audio files are available on Zeno Tonto. So, thank you. Wow! Thanks so much, Ryan. That was that was fabulous. Um, by the way, with the mule, or I mean the the donkey and the horse, the mule is, has hybrid vigor. They call it. Maybe you've heard that yeah. before. So it's like mm -hmm. the best of, of both species, uh, strength and stamina. I don't know what that does for the, the uh, cerulean um, perula pairing. Um, there was a question. Let's see. Um, do, 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 uh, oh, where did my question go? Uh, um, Thanks for mentioning that hybrid vigor. Um, that yeah. was something that I've, I've heard come up in uh, plant ecology quite a bit. We have two yeah, hybrids yeah. that actually show right. the, they're they're better than either of their parents um, in a specific environment. So it's a cool, right. cool thing. Right. Um, a question that says, would would it be hard to determine the possible parent species if you didn't already have uh, have a guess? Wouldn't it be hard to determine the parent species? Um, so if you, yeah, yeah. So you, in order to, you have to compare it to a known sequence. Mm -hmm. So for our sequences, there's there's this thing called GenBank, um, where uh, people studying genetics publish their sequences of different species, and uh, you know it's not that long ago that we finally you know. Uh, sequence the human genome and we're catching up on all other species that we can and usually that's one gene at a time. So you, you would need um, to have, in order to, to identify what the hybrid pairing was, is you have to have a hypothesis of what it is and then get the sequence of a gene from that species, uh, again if you're trying to do this from a genetic perspective, in order to compare the two. So yeah, um, that's a good question. Was there a follow up to that? Um, there was another kind of addition. Uh, it says, or are there maybe some tools you could use to automatically analyze the DNA? I don't know if you can automatically analyze DNA, but I think we kind of answered that. But there's some database out there already. Yeah, there's, there's this thing called GenBank, and so you could download all the sequences and um, just like uh, you know, use the, the um, you, you can take like 30 species and do a very similar thing to what we did with just the one species where they use the sequences to give you what the most likely um, relationship is, I guess. So if you mm -hmm. if you just wanted to look at all warblers um, and to, to figure it out, that would be possible. Okay. Anybody else have a, a question? Well, again, we really appreciate your your time and your talents. Um, so nothing uh, this year was found uh, in the valley. No unusual songs or. No, no, I haven't heard anything since then, and I have not been out as much since then. I I am now um, working at Coyote Valley National Park, and I really don't do any bird projects other than you know keep in touch with what's where and review projects as they're coming in to make sure we're not you know impacting bird species um, of conservation concern so I'm not out looking for them anywhere any you know as much as I would like to um, but I hope some of you will uh, next time you hear what you think is a cerulean or a perula 
uh, take a little extra time and get a good visual on it. And um, if it is something different, let me know. I do watch um, eBird to see uh, if there are any more popping up. And uh, just about every year we get we get one. This year they were both migrants that I saw um, oh, on eBird. Oh. Okay. All right. Well, um, again, thank you for this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you, visitors, to our our program tonight. Um, check out the website. Check out some of the challenges. Do the field trips. Um, thank you. And everybody have a great evening. Really appreciate it. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night.